Peace. And welcome to the One Black Perch Publishing Channel, where we explore topics about writing, share resources for writers, recap some of the most useful writing-related books I've come across, and make announcements about our book launches and other, other projects that we have coming up. One book niche I read pretty regularly, in part because I like to get into the heads of writers. It covers the practice of building good writing habits and how to start or continue your path as a writer when life circumstances make the path more challenging. I try to stay away from titles that come highly recommended by my book shopping, alg book shopping algorithms because I'm just anti like that. But Writing Down the Bones by Natalie Goldberg is a book I came across via word of mouth, albeit internet mouths. Writers on YouTube reference it as being helpful to them and also as an enjoyable read on top of it. Natalie Goldberg is a poet and a teacher and teaches using methods and techniques that she outlines in this book. The book is published by Shambhala, which is a imprint that publishes uh, the writing of Alan Watts, who's another writer and thinker whose books that I enjoy a lot. There aren't any long sections or chapters. Um, there's mostly two and three page long essays uh, discussing some part of the writing journey or an element of the craft of writing or how to approach and execute it. And while I appreciate direct, straightforward titles to essays on writing, it's really refreshing to have titles every now and then that surprise or at least intrigue you in some sort of way, make your ears prick up. Some fun ones are blue lipstick and a cigarette hanging out your mouth, nervously sipping wine, um, man eats car, and writing is not a McDonald's hamburger. You don't have to read these essays in order. You can skip around and you know, be prescriptive with it. Flip through and find something that resonates, or you can read it from beginning to end like I did. Either way, it has its benefits, so it's up to you. The book is meant to help you build a writing practice or find a way of going about it, going about writing regularly. It's also for those who may not intend to publish ever and simply want to write to process like life's events to maintain or obtain a working level of sanity or uh, mental stability. So I'm going to share some passages and advice from a few of her essays that deal with structuring a reliable writing practice more broadly, not just the ones for new committed aspiring authors among us. The first essay is called First Thoughts, which introduces some ground rules for free writing or brain dumping, whichever one you want to call it. In Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way, it's called Morning Pages, which is really popular. But no matter what you call them, Natalie offers six points that make the best use of your writing time. Number one is keep your hand moving. So sometimes if we like a line a lot or if a form phrase doesn't feel right when we first jot it down, it might feel natural to correct it right away, uh, doctor it up right then. But she says that's a stalling technique, keeping you from getting more words out. So don't pause to reread anything. Just keep going. You can edit later. The second one is don't cross out. That's editing. And you're supposed to be writing. So uh, sometimes our mistakes turn out to be the most useful accidents. So even if you meant to write legion instead of legal, maybe that's an opener for you to uh, take on another topic in your writing or take on the line of thoughts it brings to your current piece. Also for later though, so no mistakes, no cross outs, just keep the hand moving. The third is don't worry about spelling, punctuation, or grammar. This one is pretty tough for those who think that we're pretty precise no matter what speed we're moving at with our pen, but sometimes we skip whole words in a phrase, mistakenly leave out a proper suffix or uh, change the form of a word and affect an entire phrase. Those can be fixed in editing too, which again comes after first thoughts of that. She even mentions that you shouldn't worry about standing the margins and within the lines of a page. You can just be sloppy with it. But for the meticulous neat folk, they likely won't adhere to this at all. Some need at least a little bit of order, even in the rapid fire first start writing. But the freedom is self-acceptance is what she seems to be aiming at. But my, my favorite of all the first thought rules is go for the jugular. You know, if in the midst of writing, you come across a sensitive topic or something that's hard to address, um, something that makes you feel like overexposed and fearful, just dive right into it. Things that we avoid the most in our writing are often the things we need to, to write about the most. I say that pretty often. The way that she puts it is, is that these topics have a lot of energy and it's trapped waiting for you to give it room, room to pre breathe on the page. So you can explore and expound on it later um, after you're done, but not before, right? because you're supposed to keep the hand moving. The two other rules I would argue are actually implied within the other four, which are lose control and don't think, don't get logical, which is your internal censor. Your censorship is the control method. And that's when you want a desired outcome or to avoid a certain outcome in your writing. So you bring the censor to the editor's desk. 
An important thing to note that isn't included in her rules, but use of timed writing. So if you're just starting, she suggests 10 minutes and then gradually increasing over time. I always write with a timer, no matter what I'm writing, free writing or on assignment, just so I can gauge for myself the my, my own pace, but not necessarily to keep like a word goal. Plus, if I committed to writing multiple things in a day, I can divide the time up rather than worry about whether or not a particular piece is done. And that can leave you disappointed. So knowing you've worked on something for an hour is a better feeling than, you know, not having something done by the end of the day, but you've worked on it for four hours. It's just a helpful tool to use. Another early chapter is writing as a practice. It pairs it to beginning to run daily. The more you do it, the better you get at it, which is like anything really, but you don't wait until you're inspired to run to do it and put your shoes on and get going. You do it because it's good for you to do, despite occasional discomfort or displeasure. It should become a routine and then eventually a reflex. And then after that, it becomes a part of your identity. And it's just something that you do. But in practice, you temper your expectations so you can learn. So instead of sitting down and thinking, I'm going to write a poem today. You should, she says you should have the least expectation of yourself and say, I'm free to write the worst junk in the world. That kind of freedom allows for some exploration. And then you can fence in with whatever form you prefer to use in revision. Um, a quote that she says I'll, that I like is, if every time you sit down to write, you expect it to be great, then expect great disappointment. The ideal is to simply write every day, but even ideals are the North Star direction to stay moving toward. You know, no one's perfect and lives up to it all the time. So extend some grace to yourself if you slip. For people new to writing or returning to it after a long layoff, one of the unnoticed benefits that she mentions is how the practice of um, writing daily establishes and increases your self-trust of your mind and your body. Become more patient with yourself as you accept and go through the process. But for some, success is just as bad as failure because it can reduce your sense of urgency or drive for tomorrow if you've written today. But she says that about running again, Runners don't say, oh, I ran yesterday, I feel limber. So it's a practice, so you practice daily. You might already know all the stories you want to tell or the topics that you want to delve into with your writing, but for the ones who want to write but don't know what to write or uh, have a hard time coming up with ideas, she suggests keeping a list of topics on one page of in your notebook or wherever you keep your work. And then when you sit down to write, you can pick a topic and start. Staring at a blank page and Waiting for something to happen is just a waste. And while you don't want to judge yourself for going through that, having a sense of direction goes a long way towards actually filling up notebooks with your various stories and poems. She's nice enough to give us a list of 15 different topics to get you started if you're apprehensive about planting a flag for where you want your writing to go. You know, a couple that I borrow from my own list are uh, begin with I remember and then write lots of small memories. But if you happen to write one particular memory at length, follow where you're led. Just go with it. You know, and if you get stuck, just write, I remember again and then keep going. This is fun because it may end up producing a list of its own. And repetition is a strong tool for writers if it's used sparingly. Plus, if you want, you can remove all the I remembers after you're done. If you want like a continuous, un uninterrupted feel. Really can't go wrong with trying it out, so. Another one I haven't tried yet, but I do plan to, is to take something you feel strongly about, whether it's positive or negative, and then write about it like you love it. And then you take the same thing and you write about it as if you hate it, and then go neutral or objective. But the objectivity I might actually leave out because I prefer the stronger, biased, passionate writing, but just in general, it's a good idea overall. So list the things you have strong opinions of. It could be entertainers and celebrities, sports teams, political leaders, cultural issues. You know, are you passionate, passionate about your job? There's always fertile ground in the things closest to us. And writing about them in this kind of way is like taking inventory of our lives, too. So it could be a good therapeutic journal and exercise to keep. One that's specific that goes into a lot of different directions is to write about leaving. You're to take, to, take that to mean whatever you'd like. So that could be leaving the house, heading to work leaving your keys in a place you can't recall or uh, someone passing, you know, leaving this plan of existence. Any way you want to interpret leave is really up to you. Apply it to whatever you like. You know, like leave could also mean an exit or placing something that stays, leaving the mark. So you have have some fun with it. If you want her list that she doesn't elaborate much on are uh, writing about the stars, the most scared you've ever been, 
your first sexual experience, a book that changed your life, or a teacher that you had. Your list can be made up of anything, and it really should be anything as random as life itself. So a suggestion uh, specific to poetry that I've used before is to take a collection of poems by a writer that you like and turn to any page and borrow a line from a poem as the prompt for you to keep going in a new poem. So years ago, I used a couple of Emily Dickinson lines to generate some momentum, sort of like a runway for takeoff. But starting and ending poems was pretty tough for me back, back, back then. Um, I always thought if the opener wasn't bold, then you risk losing the reader before you even stand at the end. So uh, now I borrow from song lyrics, quotes, uh, movies, TV shows, political speeches, like literally anything, anything repeatable and memorable. If you're going to write well, you want to be specific too, so you can have the greatest effect. So you have to be curious and observant about the things that you're, you're writing about. So Natalie suggests that we writers, we live twice, once in real time, present to life's events, and then there's another part of you that you train to capture and retain that lives everything a second time. That's the one that sits down goes over everything, looking for a texture and details. In that essay, where she talks about that, it's called Living Twice. And she also makes the claim that writers practice being dumb. For example, if it rains out, people will cover themselves, they get to where they're going fast. But a writer would go back into, out into the rain with a pen and notebook in hand or your phone and examine the details of puddles, watch them fill up, listen to the droplets land, watch the lightning, uh, listen to the wheels of like cars rushing by, um, if you have a photographic memory, maybe you won't uh, have to live twice. <laughs> you can get it all on the first go. But typically, the recap days and moments taken as mental snapshots can be used to put together a complete picture, a complete enough picture to be called a life. Uh, one of the essays that stays with me, though, is writing as a communal act. And it acts that we don't judge ourselves by being influenced by what we consume. Writers aren't without their ego and we, their ego or hubris. So it's common to desire like originality and novelty above other creative priorities. But she says that writers are great lovers, meaning that as we fall in love with another writer's work, we open ourselves up to awakening, awakening a part of us that we admire in their work. So like being unlocked. I like to think of it as getting permission from another writer. So I don't consider uh, myself thieving or swagger jacking, as they used to say back in the day. The growth process, too, is communal, which puts you in a relationship with the writers that you read and study. So, you know, so know that you're bringing more than just your voice to the page. you got some backup, you know, a corner that you can go to after each round of writing or water refreshment advice to have some bruises tended to catch a second wind, that kind of thing. Um, those are just a few of the helpful and valuable tips and advice that she lays out in the book. Highly recommend it with good reason. I scan often for the different highlighted sections. Quick reminders before I, before diving into a time morning session. So hoping that some of it sticks to my ribs, so to speak. Hope you found this video helpful as you initiate or continue your writing journey. Like Natalie says, writing is a communal act. So know that you have constituents, potential constituents rooting for you, even as you learn and borrow for betterment of our craft. Subscribe for more videos on writing, editing, and publishing. Dates on submission deadlines to our journal and release dates for our projects. Till next time. Thanks for watching.